presentation we're, we're going to look at today is a, um, a quick look at, uh, at building energy modeling, and we'll touch a tiny bit on, uh, on a standard that's been developed for that, as well as uh, what you might potentially use, uh, use energy modeling for. Um, my bio is, uh, is here, some of the highlights for it. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Saskatoon. I did an international master's in sustainable energy engineering from in Stockholm. Spent a year there. Um, the the one that uh, that I find the most fun most of the time is uh, is the fact that I'm a board member from the SAS Solar Co-op, um, and uh, we uh, allow people to invest in um, in the co-op and then put. Uh, Put their money towards solar installations in the in the Saskatoon area, and I will be sharing the uh, um, the my time here in this presentation with Lindsay. So the National Energy Code of Canada for Buildings uh, is uh, provides the minimum requirements for the design and construction of energy efficient buildings and covers the building envelope systems and equipment for the heating, ventilation and air conditioning, service water, heating, lighting and the provision of electric motors, uh, electric power systems and motors. This is exciting stuff. This is this is cool. Um, now, as Lindsay reminded me, perhaps not quite this exciting, but uh, but it's still pretty exciting stuff. Now, the the question here is so how do you create excitement around code? Um, it just doesn't quite seem to match this somehow. It's just uh, there's uh, there's a bit of a, a discrepancy here. What you can do is make it reasonable and approachable, something that people can understand, but then you add a bit of opportunity to it. So what the NECB has done is it's made it uh, the this is a a, a structure that maps quite well into what our normal uh, development process looks like. Part three is the architect's responsibility, four and seven are the electrical engineer, and five and six are the mechanical engineer. It just kind of, it, it fits, it's, it's understandable, it's, um, it's reachable. And it's not rocket science. Most of what's in there is stuff that we would normally do in good, uh, in good design practice. What's different, and what we're gonna talk about today, is this last one, this performance compliance modeling. This allows you to look at code in a, in a different way. It still has that, um, that prescriptive path that we're used to, um, you know, the list of you can do these things, you, you can't do these other things, um, you know, the, the stuff that we're, that we're used to when we, when we look at codes. Um, but then the NECB has another uh, feature that allows you to do a little bit of trading off within things. So if you're, if the if there's one piece is just a little bit too stringent, well maybe you can, you, know, you can um, modify it a little bit and and do a little bit of something else instead. Of the best example of this is um, is the is with windows and uh, and wall. Um, if you if you find your wall assembly is just um, not quite um, just not working for you. It's just it, it becomes too expensive to uh, to construct. You can actually put a a wall assembly in that's a little bit less than what's required by code, but you can put better windows in, or you can put fewer windows in to compensate for that. Uh, so you can do some trade-offs in there. And then what performance compliance modeling does? So doing a an energy model on the building is it allows you to do that trade-off on a much bigger and broader um, spectrum of things. So you you can then um, potentially make your envelope um, less, uh, even less insulated and substitute a, uh, um, a really high performing uh, heat recovery ventilation system or, or something like that. And the, the computer um, energy model will allow you to do some of those trade-offs and, and really to do some some design optimization. So the way it's set up in the performance path is we develop a uh, an energy model of the building as you've designed it, and then we build a a parallel model, one that looks that looks very similar, except it has all the characteristics of the 
uh, of the prescriptive requirements. So when you when you run the model on that, what it ends up being is the worst case building that you can build and still pass code. So as long as you've got some piece of your proposed uh, building that is better, then it's going to perform better, and your and you you can show compliance by showing that the energy the predicted energy consumption of the building that you've designed is less than what this worst case reference would be. That's the kind of the, the big picture of what we're trying to do. There's a lot of subtleties in that, of course. Um, but that's, the, that's where we are. And I'm gonna pass off to Lindsay now, who's gonna give you a few more details of um, what this energy model might look like and some of the other things that you could potentially do with it. Thanks very much, Kelly. Uh, I'll just get set up sharing my screen here. Can you see the presentation now? Yes, we can. Great. Just give me one more moment. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction, Laura, and thank you, Kelly, for setting it all up. I want to talk a little bit about uh, building energy modeling today. So first off, uh, whole building energy modeling, it's a comprehensive evaluation of the major contributors uh, to the energy use in a building. It includes many components, uh, which you can see listed on this slide. So the building location and orientation, weather and climate, uh, the type of building enclosure or what the constructions are, which make up the building. Uh, it takes into account factors such as the infiltration of air into the building, um, the air leakage, uh, occupancy and use type, uh, the amount of lighting and receptacle and process loads which are present, uh, the domestic hot water, as well as energy used uh, for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, when you couple this with the uh, utility rates um, for your building, we can get a good picture of the overall energy uh, use um, on an annual basis. Um, so you can see here, there's a pie graph. Uh, we kind of see a representative uh, for a building in a uh, cold climate like Manitoba. Um, we have a heating dominated climate. So therefore a large proportion of our energy goes to heating, but um, there are certainly significant other energy end uses as well. So you might ask, uh, well, why energy modeling? Um, well, as Kelly mentioned, we might be doing it for code compliance. And in fact, we do have to comply with energy code and there are many different codes at the moment, uh, which apply for different circumstances, uh, different types of buildings, different sizes, and different jurisdictional codes as well. Um, in addition, you might perform energy modeling to comply with a third party rating system or certification. Um, so this could be LEED, uh, it could be Green Globes. Uh, you might be trying to achieve perhaps a net zero energy or net zero carbon building, or maybe you wanna comply with the Passive House standard um, in any case, energy modeling helps to optimize building energy use uh, as the associated energy cost and can contribute to uh, achieving emissions performance as well. Um, energy modeling can also aid in the operational, operational performance and monitoring and verification, as well as help you assess potential upgrades and retrofits and generally improve occupant comfort, health and productivity. So who is involved in energy modeling? Well, uh, we've got the building owners and developers, the people who own uh, the building stock and, and who uh, operate it. We've got uh, energy modelers, which can be engineers, architects, or otherwise specialized consultants. Um, we've got the building design team, architects, civil, mechanical, and electrical engineers. We also have uh, contractors and tradespeople, code officials, and uh, folks uh, representing the authority having jurisdiction as well as third-party uh, rating system and incentive program reviewers. Um, so this could be uh, someone from Efficiency Manitoba, maybe a representative from the new buildings program and that incentive program. Uh, it could be a lead reviewer or uh, other organization. Uh, so energy modeling can be used at many stages throughout the building life cycle. Uh, modeling provides a compliance path for energy code and can inform design decisions, as well as assist in commissioning, testing, and benchmarking. In a post-occupancy context, it can be used to support retro commissioning and evaluate retrofits and renewals as part of an ongoing building asset management strategy. And lastly, building energy modeling can be used for research and technology development, uh, which in turn can inform policy, codes, and standards 
and thereby complete uh, the life cycle. Now, recognizing an industry need, uh, ASHRAE has released standard 209, which is energy simulation aided design for buildings. And it's intended for all buildings except for low rise residential, as these typically follow different codes and standards. Uh, ASHRAE 209 is a valuable resource both for clients of modeling as well as the modeling consultants uh, to both understand where the energy modeling is used and how it should be best applied. Um, this is a, an outline of uh, the structure of standard 209. So you can see that it covers many different aspects um, from basic purpose, scope, and definitions to details on uh, general requirements for modeling, as well as how uh, design modeling um, and different types of modeling should be conducted. And it also includes some helpful info for modelers as well, uh, some resources and uh, uh, references for important aspects of modeling. So here we have a typical building project timeline. Uh, we start at RFQ or RFP, and we progress through schematic design, design development, uh, development of construction drawings, um, actual construction and occupancy. Um, on the lower portion of this chart, uh, we lay out some of the potential energy models that can be produced, uh, progressing in detail and complexity as the design uh, matures and the building is occupied. So starting on the left, we have a simple box model, and then conceptual design, uh, load reduction model, um, design development, construction change orders, as built, etc. In our practice, we typically see about six primary model types, uh, conceptual, schematic, design development, permit, final, and post-occupancy calibrated models. And you can see some of the characteristics with each uh, related to each here. Conceptual is usually a simple box uh, which compares um, alternatives in size, shape, and orientation. Schematic looks at things from a high level. Um, as the design progresses, um, we refine uh, the model through design development and eventually produce models based on permits and construction. I'll get into each uh, a little bit in a second here. Uh, so as I mentioned, the conceptual design model, uh, this is a simple box with simplified geometry. Uh, this needs to be very quick and easy to, uh, to run as we typically evaluate uh, single aspect alternatives at a high level. So we might make, look at the size and shape or orientation of a building. Things that really, uh, once they are set uh, in a design uh, are very unlikely to be changed. We wanna look at these aspects as early as possible. A conceptual design model allows us to perform a rough energy assessment and we can uh, perform comparisons to high level benchmarks as well. In schematic design, we're gonna further refine the simple box model. We're gonna implement uh, some basic geometry, shape and orientation, which uh, would be established by the design team and the client, um, as well as our analyses. We're also gonna look at uh, the initial construction, fenestration and HVAC system types. As we enter design and progress through design development, uh, we're gonna refine all aspects of the energy model. We're going to incorporate updates uh, from the evolving design and provide comparisons and evaluate trade-off opportunities, which might include uh, different levels of insulation, different types of wall or roof constructions, um, glazing types, HVAC system types, and specific parameters corresponding to particular equipment, which uh, the design team might have in mind. And this eventually evolves into the permit model, uh, which might be required uh, for a construction permit. So therefore it's based on the issued for construction documents. Uh, it supports the permit application and it documents the as designed uh, building energy performance for compliance uh, for, with code or uh, certification or incentive programs. Uh, once construction is completed, uh, we enter the as built uh, document stage. So we're gonna produce a final or as built model which documents uh, the as, um, <clears throat> the uh, as built uh, construction and energy performance. Uh, the next stage would be a calibrated model. Um, so this is an evolution of the as built model. Um, it's refined with post occupancy operational information. Um, and to calibrate an energy model, uh, we use a variety of uh, information sources. So energy meter readings and billings. Um, or perhaps data from commissioning, retro commissioning, or measurement and verification activities. And this might include uh, HVAC system control settings uh, or particular operation, 
or information on the occupancy levels, the types of specific types of use and actual uh, occupancy schedules. And we can use these calibrated models to evaluate uh, potential upgrades and retrofits um, with a greater degree of accuracy. And lastly, um, you might also perform some single aspect simulations. So these are focused studies of a particular aspect uh, related to the building model. Um, so it could be massing and orientation early on in the life cycle, or perhaps we want to look at uh, solar gain and shading, um, the use of and positioning of lighting, uh, the use of natural light and the effect of glare on the occupants. Uh, we might look at uh, different trade-offs between the envelope or the facade. Um, we might do specific studies of thermal comfort um, where it might relate to productivity, for example. Uh, some other aspects that might be um, examined are natural ventilation or on-site renewable energy generation or different HVAC system uh, types. Um, so we can provide some input to the design team to guide uh, their selection. And with that, I'll pass it back to Kelly. Thanks, Lindsay. I just avoided the you are on mute uh, uh, thing there by actually hitting the button first. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit now, we've introduced what, what energy modeling is. Uh, we thought we'd just touch a little bit on code. I don't want to go into too much detail here because we've got some, um, a few other uh, uh, presentations on that. Uh, the, um, one of my roles is, uh, is on the um, uh, performance compliance task group with the code development uh, process. Um, and I uh, also had an opportunity to do a little bit of a training course to some building code officials. And we had uh, uh, one of NRCAN's um, code development people in there who gave us a bit of, an, uh, of a, a hint as to where things are going. So I thought I'd share just a tiny bit of that with you. First of all, where we're at right now, um, Manitoba was actually one of the first jurisdictions to, uh, to adopt the energy code. And it's a slightly modified version of the NECB 2011. Uh, a few changes to um, to it uh, um, that uh, that make it perform um, almost more like uh, the 2015 version of the code. Uh, a couple of a couple of updates. There's a, also a nice program in Manitoba that uh, Efficiency Manitoba now runs that um, has the uh, the effect of implementing, um, uh, assisting with the implementation of the code by providing a little bit of incentive and, and uh, um, encouraging the, uh, the uh, performance path um, uh, as, the, as the choice for code compliance. And um, the implementation of it includes a coordinated registered professional, so someone to kind of uh, um, bring everything together and submit to the, uh, to the AHJs. So looking a little bit ahead, um, there are a number of uh, jurisdictions that have implemented NECB 2017, um, including, uh, including Saskatchewan. Uh, it inclu includes some lower U values for fenestration and doors. Um, and uh, one of the things that actually makes one of the biggest differences is the uh, requirement to do some additional thermal bridging calculations. And we'll touch a little bit on that in a, in a minute or two as well. In addition, NECB 2020 is on its way. Um, uh, the pandemic delayed uh, the publication of this document by about a year. So we're now expecting it to come out in December of this year. Um, it includes some additional um, improvements in uh, fenestration uh, values. And um, it also has a, a, a the uh, any of you who are familiar with codes know that uh, that uh, the residential code 936 um, includes some compensation for the how tight you can get a building with the what the air leakage is. The NECB to date does not, um, partially because large buildings can be very difficult to do any kind of tests on. But what 2020 will allow you to do is uh, incorporate. Uh, those test results into your model. The other thing that's happening in, in 2020, which uh, um, anybody who's familiar with 936 will be aware of, is the introduction of tiers. 
there will be um, uh, tiers available for uh, AHJs to uh, or jurisdictions to incorporate um, within the NECB 2020. There's some interesting work on harmonizing uh, code adoption um, across the uh, across the country. Um, Saskatchewan uh, a little while ago uh, implemented a, a legislation that um, creates the automatic adoption of code uh, within a year uh, or exactly a year from when it's published. So all of the codes, all of our codes are automatically adopted and Manitoba has legislation in place to do the same. And the, the goal is to make that happen across the country. The other interesting thing that we got from uh, from the session we had a couple of weeks ago is that uh, there is some work happening over the next few years on uh, existing buildings and how, in particular, the NECB might apply to existing buildings, what that might look like. Currently, the NECB does not apply to existing buildings. I think we skipped a slide ahead. Oh, no, we didn't. So I talked, um, I mentioned that we were going to talk a little bit about uh, the thermal bridging um, stuff and, and how NECB 2017 is different and some of the things you might see when uh, when ANTO or future codes come into place. Uh, we, we already know that um, the NECB um, and, and all of the codes use an effective U value for the for the for the um, wall assembly, so any of the studs and and uh, the the regular thermal bridges that happen uh, need to be accounted for. What's different in 2017 is that we now need to in include some of the extra things that happen: um, balconies, uh, um, the uh, structural supports for uh, uh, canopies, uh, the extra framing that happens around. Um, around windows and in the corners and that kind of stuff. So we can't, uh, uh, the previous codes allowed you to basically neglect those and we can't do that anymore uh, with the 2017 and future codes. Now there's a, there's a couple of tools that have been developed. The um, uh, Building Envelope Thermal Bridging Guide uh, by Morrison Hirschfield helps with that. There is in, um, in Passive House, there's a Mold 5 software that they that they use to try and account for some of these uh, these bridges. So there, there's a few tools that exist. Just kind of the this slide gives you a little bit of a of a description of why this becomes important. Um, you end up with a fair bit of heat uh, can be transferred through relatively small spaces when you when those when those uh, penetrations are um, good thermal conductors, which they often are when they're structural. So the concept behind this uh, thermal transmittance stuff, now if you see the equation across the bottom there, you've got your, um, your, your effective U value that you're looking for, and it's made up of your clear wall component, um, which is on the right-hand side of the equation, plus what's called the psi value or the the kind of a factor for the thermal transmittance of linear components like the balcony or the parapet or um, or window framing and uh, as well as a chi value uh, which doesn't show up in this particular example of any of the the point um, uh, things that might stick through uh, a, a beam to support uh, a canopy or or something like that. So you add up all of these all of these things together to get the overall um, effective U value. And in our experience, there can be uh, up to 25% or, or sometimes even more of the thermal um, conductance can happen through these extra. Um, uh, linear and, and point transmittance components that really wasn't accounted for before. So just as a quick wrap up, we've looked at uh, the uh, NECB and its um, uh, and the performance path as an option to um, to comply with code. 
Uh, we, uh, Lindsay talked a bit about ASHRAE 209 and how it's, uh, it's a way of sort of formalizing the energy modeling process and also a little bit about um, where we might be going uh, with energy codes. And uh, we'll open it up to questions now for a bit. Um, I know there's some have happened in the chat already. Um, and I don't know if they've been answered or not because I've been talking. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've been uh, trying to uh, type away here and, and answer some of the questions in the chat. If anybody uh, wants some more clarification on those or feel like I didn't really uh, answer your question, by all means, please uh, uh, bring it up again. I, I put a question in at the very beginning uh, regarding when you're modeling, be able to model the construction cost at the same time, because it's all great and wonderful to make a wall more thermally uh, efficient. And then you find out it's, you just drove the building over budget. Uh, and so in the decision-making process, how do you deal with that right now? So one of the things that we do, uh, we, we aren't um, um, quantity estimators. Uh, so we don't, uh, we don't really know what the, uh, what the cost might be. But what we do is a bit of an analysis of what the value of those energy savings might be. So if you were to add another R10 to your, uh, to your insulation, to your wall insulation, what is the energy cost value of that, um, of the, of that energy? Uh, and we extrapolate that over, over a different um, life cycle. So if it's envelope stuff, we typically use 30 years as a life as a lifetime. So then that brings it back to to today's dollars. And say if you're gonna you're gonna save three thousand dollars in energy over the next 30 years, if you can implement that extra insulation for less than three thousand dollars, then it's gonna pay for itself. So that's how we handle that. 